Well, everybody, thank you for coming to our Libido Zappers lecture. This is the first time we've done this, and the reason we chose this topic, obviously, Tuesday is Valentine's Day, so if anybody doesn't know that, and you have some quick gifts to go and scramble for, you've got time. Um, but Libido Zappers, a lot of times on our symptom survey, um, our new patient intake, people will mark that that's a concern of theirs. And we're seeing it in men and women and young people, middle-aged, older people. So it's kind of across the spectrum. And so when we dove into that and researched it a little bit, the reason why it's such a widespread issue for people is because it's very multifactorial. There's several things that play into libido or sex drive. So I'm going to just take a minute to introduce myself for anybody that hasn't heard my story and why we stay late on Friday nights and do these health talks for you guys. Um, I got interested in the healthcare field very early on. Um, I knew that I wanted to be a doctor from seventh grade on, so I was always really good at health and wellness, um, interested in math and sciences over history and English and that kind of thing. Um, but it was my own health story that led me to really have a passion for it and want to bring it to the masses and, you know, then pursue natural medicine. And so, um, if you haven't heard my story, uh, I, in high school, started developing pelvic pain. And so, the medical treatments would work temporarily, and then they wouldn't work, and then they would make me do more of the same thing. And it just got progressively more aggressive to the point where I had to kind of stop and think, hold on a second, this can't be all there is as far as what does real health mean to me and what are my choices to recover my own health and well-being. And so for me, I was having surgeries around the clock, like every two years I would have some kind of surgery and then that would be followed by a course of hormones. Mm -hmm. And so when I talk about, um, do a lot of lectures, a lot of them are focused around female health, hormone health, and that kind of thing because I'm passionate about it and I went through my own personal walk through all of this. Mm -hmm. I didn't know better back then and so I followed the doctor's recommendations like a lot of people would. Um, and then it kind of led me to my own discovery over time. So my treatments were surgeries, pain medications, um, hormone treatments, and then it would only last every two years. So finally I was sick of being poked and prodded and going through all the regular diagnostics and lab tests and all that kind of stuff and I said, hold on a second, let me consider my options. And so that's how I found health and wellness and natural medicine. And over the years as I've been able to recuperate my own health and learn more, I've been able to learn how to treat more complicated cases in the practice. So today we have a family wellness practice. We see kids, we see women, we see pregnant moms, we see people perimenopause, menopause, postmenopausal. We see men in all you know phases of their cycle as well. And so we've seen miraculous recoveries in our practice and we know that health and wellness, we know nutrition especially and lifestyle changes are huge. So you guys can take this stress assessment a little bit later. That's gonna be the next paper in your packet. But stress is a major influence on sex drive and libido, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But this is a quiz that you guys can take just to kind of rate your stress levels. One thing we talk about in the office often is that people kind of under downplay how much stress they're under because everybody's stressed, right? Mm -hmm. That's just our culture and our civilization is that we're burning the candle at both ends. We're trying to balance work, play, home life, careers, whatever. Um, and we think we're doing a really good job at it, right? <laughs> so on the outside, we can walk the walk and we can do our thing, um, and we might be able to even make it look pretty, but then we go home and we crash, or we have nothing left over at the end of the day. And there's your libido, you know, the beginning of the libido. We don't have time for that. We just want to rest and crash and relax. Um, so the stress assessment really kind of helps you hone in on what is stressing you or how much stress you have. And so, if we can't always eliminate all the stressors of everyday life, I can't tell everybody to quit their jobs and move to a remote island, as nice as that would be. I would like a, like a script for that myself. So if you find another practitioner willing to write it, let me know. That would be awesome. But if we can't avoid the inevitable stressors of everyday life, then what we do and focus on in the practice is trying to build up your body's adaptability and re like build up your reserve level so that you can handle that stress a lot better. It doesn't keep just whittling away at your overall well-being. So this is something that you can take on your own. And then we'll get right into the heart of the lecture tonight. 
So first, I guess we need to come into agreement about what the definition of libido is, just so we know what we're talking about. Um, as you might su suspect, libido is defined as a person's overall sexual drive. And something that I thought was interesting right in the definition was that it can be influenced by biological, psychological, and social factors. So tonight, I'm going to talk to you more about the biological stuff, and then Mary is going to talk on the psychological and social factors. So we're going to kind of tag team back and forth. So what I always like to do is kind of compare and contrast in the beginning of our conversation what would be the medical approach for our lecture tonight, which is titled Libido Zappers, and then what would be the, me the wellness model or the holistic approach to this. So the medical model is why we had this lecture in the first place, because you see all those commercials splattered all over, you know, try this pill, the little blue pill, Viagra, and you see the couples in the bathtub holding hands in the sunlight, and all that kind of stuff. So the medical model would be to treat the symptoms. So medicines that you're probably familiar with would be Viagra. Um, hormone replacement therapy is another way that we treat it for men and women in America. Bioidentical hormones. Or my favorite, which goes on every list, is antidepressants, right? So if they can't find something that's physically, structurally wrong with you, then they call it depression, and then they have a pill for that as well, right? I know. They once told me that I was, they couldn't find what was wrong with me during my journey to health and recovery, and they told me that I was depressed, and I was like, well, you must not know me very well because I don't think anybody in my entire life has ever accused me of being depressed. <laughs> I think you've got it wrong, but that's what they do. Um, so here are the side effects because I think sometimes because we hear all those commercials so regularly, we start to, it just starts to kind of become numb to us. So what are the side effects? Blindness, hearing loss, Men have actually had to have penile amputations for prolonged erections because they can't stop the blood flow. Um, sudden decrease in blood pressure, heart attack symptoms, breathing difficulties, and hives. So what did I put in capital letters next to that? <laughs> Not sexy. <laughs> None of that is going to give you any more libido than what you were trying to start out with, right? So in the wellness model, let's compare and contrast. The wellness model always asks the question, why? So I'm not going to point to, I usually point, like if you all came in with, and I usually use headaches as an example, but if you all came in with low libido or questioning to me as to patients, we would have to under, understand what's the underlying root of each person's individual libido issue. And so that might be as varied as, and the list says, it could be hormone imbalances, so we all kind of associate hormones and understand that. It could be stress, which we already alluded to. Circulatory problems, so cardiovascular issues are an issue there. Um, blood sugar imbalance, so everybody knows me, I'm anti-sugar and anti-carbs. It affects everything. Um, under or overactive thyroid function, adrenal fatigue, liver toxicity, it could actually be a side effect of medications that you're taking, uh, emotional health, which we have Mary here to cover, or self-esteem, which again would come under the um, psychological and social factors. Could, so can you see how varied that is? We talked about heart, lungs, liver, thyroid, adrenal glands, all in the medical model would be considered separate individual issues. In the holistic model, one of those areas can't go out of balance without the others following suit, okay? So, in accordance with that, if everybody came in with a different underlying cause of low libido, then we would treat you each individually, completely separate protocols or suggestions for what we would do for each of those issues. So now let's dive into some of the things in everyday life that might be zapping your libido, excuse me. Um, so Aaron said sugar, 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 sugar. We talk about that all the time. It's on every naughty list. And high carbs go into that same thing. So the issue with sugar and carbohydrates is the body doesn't know the difference between good carbs, bad carbs. Yes, it might take the body longer to process certain types of carbohydrates versus white sugar, for example, but it's a cumulative effect of the overall carbohydrate intake. Um, Low-fat diets. 
Does anybody still think low fat diets are cool? Hmm. You guys all know better? They're all smart in this room, but some people are surprised that a low fat diet isn't healthy. The reason is because your body needs healthy fats to produce your hormones. So if you're starving your body of fats, you're going to have hormone imbalance, and you never know what hormones it's going to be. It's thyroid, adrenal, or male or female reproductive hormones. Um, food preservatives are an issue. So when we say clean eating, that means kind of avoid the canned and the boxed foods and stick to like fresh produce and actual, you know, things that you recognize and don't have a label. Did you ever notice that if you buy chicken? Well, some chicken has labels, and then you should question that. <laughs> chicken doesn't really come with a label to tell you what's in it, and a strawberry doesn't have a label to tell you what's in it because it's just what it is, right? Um, red food dye was specifically listed as an issue for libido. Plastics. Does anybody know why plastics might be on the list? Estrogens. Yeah. So plastics can mimic estrogens in the body, and they're considered, plastics as well as the next category, xenoestrogens, are considered endocrine disruptors. So your endocrine system is your system that produces hormones. There's several or glands in the body that are com comprise the entire endocrine system, but they all produce hormones. So plastics, xenoestrogens, are often found in things like cosmetics, pesticides, nail polish, sunscreen, and then growth hormones in non, you know, commercial poultry and meats. Um, alcohol can actually lower libido, so a lot of people think they're taking that to kind of relax and get in the mood and everything, but it can actually become an issue. Uh, stress, we put the stress on there. Uh, sleep deprivation can become an issue. If you're obese or overweight, that can start to cause um, hormone imbalances and that can be linked to your sugar issues and so on. Lack of exercise or a sedentary lifestyle. So that kind of ties into the circulatory system if you're not getting enough blood flow going as well as stress. So you need exercise just as a good stress outlet to burn off your stress hormones. And then there's a huge list of medications. So up above I said, you know, one of the reasons that a particular person might have lower libido is actually side effects from common medications. Those medications range from anything from birth control to antidepressants, um, antihistamines, which I was surprised about that. Um, I was reading about glaucoma meds for like the pressure behind the eyes, not only the medications, but just the drops. So would you ever think that just putting some drops in your eyes would affect something like this whole biochemical chain that we call libido? So you've gotta know your side effects, right? And weigh the pros and cons of taking some of this stuff. Beta blockers for blood pressure, anti-anxiety meds, anti-seizure meds. Here's one that I read on, hair loss medications. You know Propecia, that was one of the, but I don't know if they use that particular med anymore, but hair loss medications. The effects of that on libido could actually be irreversible. Oh, wow, really? Yeah. So here you are, again, trying to look sexy, trying to look good, trying to do your thing, and boom, gone forever. So you gotta know your side effects, right? You've gotta know what, you need to know this. You need to be empowered to, to make a decision, an informed decision. Insecticides. So you guys have a lot more insecticides down here in Florida than we had up north because of the critters that take over. <laughs> and then chlorines and chloramines. And so those are could be in your showers, drinking water, pools, whatever. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> so I'm gonna stop my part of the lecture and have Mary get up and talk about the emotional side of libido. And then I'm gonna close out with the positive news. So I always bum you out first and bring light and statistics to the whole thing. And then we're gonna end with the empowerment about what do you do about all of this stuff. <coughs> well, I'm very happy to be here. And um, my office is actually across the hall. I am a dating and relationship coach. And so libido comes up often in conversations that I have. And as Dr. Christie said, my portion to cover will be what's the emotional and even spiritual aspects. So if you turn the page there in your handout, you have some more fun information.
And I, I will go through these. Obviously, it's something that you can spend some more time on at home as well. Usually, when you're doing one of these surveys, that gut reaction is the, the truest um, account of what you really feel about it. So, as um, we said before, sexual dysfunction has many causes, and when you dig a little deeper, you might find that there is some kind of a thought pattern that you didn't even realize had been developing a while. And being able to change your mindset is as cumbersome as being able to change your lifestyle with your foods and different things. But still, there's, there's steps, there's tools, you know, there's, there's ways to make that happen. So let's look over this list and see what um, might come up for you. Number one, an emotional sexual block could have occurred in your childhood due to lack of bonding in infancy, rigid antisexual teaching, dysfunctional or chaotic home life. And it, it's interesting to step back and look at that. I mean, some of it you may not even be aware of if, as an infant. And yet, there's some subtle messages happening to your psyche. You think about how much we benefit just from everyday touch. And, and that begins to um, carry forward as you grow up. Number two, I could have a lack of desire due to goal-oriented or mechanical sex, uncaring or unsafe atmosphere, struggle with gender identity. So those are some, some deeper issues, and it's um, things that you're wrestling with. They, they may be in the forefront of your thoughts it may be something that you have suppressed but we have so many things going on inside of us all the time <laughs> and we don't usually take time to realize what what am I thinking what am I feeling what's really going on what is um, my struggle so being able to take some time for yourself let some of these ideas come to the surface number three my perception towards sex may have been influenced by Religious beliefs that place a negative connotation on sex. Conflict about my actions matching my spiritual values. Vows made as a faith commitment. Now, we definitely live in the South, and there's different mindsets towards um, what the church says, how many people are being influenced by that, you know, where this is the Bible Belt, and, and, and I'm for all the good things in the Bible, and yet I know that there are negative messages out there and sometimes it is our mindset from childhood that takes that in and we may be taking good information in through our filter that then turns it into something else once it is um, you know between this part and this part right here mm -hmm. so it's it's a a little bit tricky to think is the message i'm receiving off negative limiting whatever or is it my filter, my perception, that has actually twisted this message and now I'm, I'm feeling a conflict? And just like Dr. Christie mentioned earlier, if your self-esteem is affected, then everything is affected. Someone could say, how's your day? And if you have a, a filter that is, is struggling with um, perceiving that in a healthy way, you may think someone is like, well, how's your day? And that wasn't how they meant it. They are genuinely going, how's your day? So uh, some of those subtle things that, that come up that have affected us. And then number four, an unconscious barrier to sex could be present because of absence of physical satisfaction, sexual phobia, lack in emotional connection with partner. Um, the very last one there, the lack of emotional connection with partner, is, is like my area of expertise. I have a program that I'm working with women right now that says, awake and engage your passion and playfulness. And, and I really think you, you do have to kind of wake up. And I was telling this um, at another engagement last night, and I said, everybody has a snooze button. Sometimes you push that snooze button many times before you wake up. So thinking about those things that are inside of us, we, we may need to push that snooze button or we may need extra effort to actually awaken some of those ideas, but it is very much possible. And when you are at a place 
relationship is safe and you want things to grow, that there are ways you can actually grow your intimacy. You can, um, I found that when you value your own thoughts, feelings, and needs, you can put it into words, you know, you can, you can value it up here, you can put it into words, that's huge. But then those words have to connect with this other person here that you're trying to build this bond with. So it's like several steps. I, I think about um, when you're doing laundry, you know, there's many steps. You have to get the clothes, you have to put sort them, put them in the washer, put them in the dryer, fold them, put them away. It's not a one-step process. So communication, very, very similar. And especially if you're going for that deeper communication, that's not just who's playing tonight, what's the weather tomorrow. Um, we have to, if you want to connect, you have to go to those deeper layers. And that's something that I um, just love working with people. And my personal story, which I could have shared on the front side of this, but I um, recovered from um, a 26 year period of sexual dysfunction. And uh, once that, I was liberated from that, I'm like, it's time to share this. You know, there's too many good things that have happened in my life to keep it to myself. I want to be able to impart that to others. And so I lead women's empowerment outreaches. I've been able to speak even internationally on sexual, recovering from sexual trauma and dysfunction. And the bottom line is, why stay there? You know, there are ways to get past that so it doesn't limit you, so it doesn't rob you of this joy. And it's, it's my joy to walk with women in that process while they are making that discovery. Awesome. Okay. Very good. Okay, so we're going to go over a couple of things that you can do to recover your libido. Did you know that there are foods that you can eat to get you in the mood? No, 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 no. So pick and choose, and don't necessarily eat all these together. I was writing it and I was like, this is a horrible menu. But if maybe we should have a contest. Whoever can put the most of these in one meal for Valentine's Day and put a picture on our page, you win something. We'll figure out how to win. So here's your challenge. You have to combine oysters. I think everybody knows that. Everybody's always heard of that, right? Bananas. I didn't know that. Be careful on the bananas because they are high carb, sorry. Bell peppers, truffles, I don't mean chocolate truffles, I mean the ones that they have to go and dig up underground, you know, they're like a mushroom family or something, they're really expensive, Those, they're delicious. You're missing out if you haven't had a truffle. Never had one. I, I thought you meant it was like the candy. I said, no, wow, what's that doing on chocolate here? is on here though, <laughs> just so you know. I made sure I made the list. <laughs> Celery. Celery was in there a lot about libido and circulation and antioxidants, so that was a surprise to me. Watermelon was in there, asparagus, chocolate, okay, so I'm talking dark chocolate, <laughs> low dark sugar, chocolate. Dark yeah, chocolate. the darker the better. Garlic, which again, don't eat right before, <laughs> not sexy, <laughs> not sexy. <laughs> Avocado, because of the healthy fats, right? We needed those fats to produce our hormones. And then healthy fats, here's a list of them. Um, healthy grass-fed butter. So did you know you can eat butter? What is grass-fed butter? So Kerrygold is an example. It'll say that it was the animals were grass-fed. So good organic grass-fed butter is good, but not all butter is created equal, just like not all everything else is created equal. Coconut oil is a favorite for, of ours. Um, olive oil, more for drizzling on salads or after you've cooked the vegetables, not so much for sauteing or actually cooking in. Um, tuna, salmon, sardines, all those high fat um, seafoods are good for you. So those don't all really go well together, do they? No, but those are the top foods for libido, so somehow you got to mix them all in. So let's talk about what is the real solution. Um, real <coughs> solutions would be look up your products anything that you clean your house with or you put on your body for hygiene and whatnot there's actually a website and an app where you can go and it rates the safety so a lot of 
these products, remember, are in the endocrine disruptor category and are also carcinogenic, and that's because of the downward trend on emotional, or no, I'm sorry, not emotional, um, hormonal health. Um, so EWG is the Environmental Workers Group, and you can go and put ingredients or products in, or the um, Skin Deep app is actually put out by them, and you can download it on your phone and scan barcodes and stuff and spend a really long time in the grocery store and have people look at you really weird, which I do all the time. <laughs> Swap out plastic containers um, for glass or ceramic. <laughs> and definitely, if you are still using plastic containers, do not put them in the microwave and do not freeze them either. So I think people know the whole thing about you can't heat up plastic, like the water bottles, and you don't leave the water bottle sitting in your car and drink out of it because mm -hmm. it will leach plastic, which is the hormone disruptor, right into the water. So those are kind of easy things that you could go out and do right away, right? You don't have to go and get a lot of props or whatever. Um, plastic water bottles, switch them out for glass or aluminum. There's all sorts of creative new containers for that. Um, laundry detergent, again, go chemical free. There's lots of ones that are made with enzymes that'll break down and, and have a detergent effect and get stains out and orders out of your clothes. Um, go chlorine free. So on the personal hygiene products for women like tampons and pads, um, there are toilet papers that are chlorine free, um, pa your paper towels and coffee filters, so go for the ones that don't have the chlorine. Because all paper, believe it or not, does not have to be white. It actually didn't start out white. That's one of those things that I get think, like again, we just get so used to and we don't challenge. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But if you stop and think for a second, you're like, oh well, yeah, that had to be pr processed or treated somehow. Um, avoid stimulants, so remember we said caffeine was on the list. So the whole idea again is if you're constantly stimulating the body, stimulating, 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 your body is in what we call fight or flight. Mm -hmm. So that means it's thriving on stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline. Well, if your body's in fight or flight, it's not in the rest and repair. But remember, you, you need to create a calm atmosphere and a calm environment for the body to come down off of that fight or flight to improve and enhance your libido. Um, where were we? Get a lot of rest, so that means seven to nine hours of sleep per night. Um, you can go to Home Depot or Lowe's and just get a real simple shower head or, or drinking water filter, like $20, $30. doesn't have to be super expensive to at least start filtering out the chlorine in your water. The other thing for chlorinated water, um, if you just let it sit, like if you pour out a big container of water or like a bucket of water or something and let it sit overnight, over a 24 hour period, it will actually, all that chlorine gas will evaporate off of it. So you can treat your water. You don't have to put anything in it. Um, something that you've noticed, we always have the uh, essential oil diffusers going in here. So avoiding the, the perfumes and, and synthetic fragrances, both the room, for the room as well as on your body. Um, so essential oils are just natural and a lot of them actually have therapeutic effects. The one that we're putting out tonight is called Passion. <laughs> Go figure. Um, chemical free, there are chemical free um, soaps, toothpaste, all that kind of stuff. Um, high intensity exercise specifically was, would help with the circulatory, so walking and yoga and all that is super great on the rest and restore side of things, but you do need to get your, your blood pressure up and your heart pumping and your blood flowing for the circulatory effects. Um, eating clean, which we kind of talked about that, that means no boxes or cans basically, right? Just eat it. We said if it had a mother or it had eyeballs or it grew out of the ground, it's, a, it's safe to eat. Just simple rules. There's something, one of the books over here, just so you guys know too, this is a lending library. So if you're ever here sitting um, and waiting for your appointment or you have a few minutes to come in early, you know, definitely read some of these titles. But you can also check these books out. And there is one that's called Food Rules. And so like what I just said, the funny thing about if it doesn't have a mother or eyeballs that grow out of the ground, don't eat it. But it's simple little rules that kind of stick in your head. So you don't have to be a biochemist and a master label reader to figure out how to shop or what to purchase in the stores. Another really simple one is if your grandmother didn't recognize it as food, it's probably not food. <laughs> it probably was chemically created and they put a label and called it food. 
Um, stress reduction. So that could mean any number of things. You know, everybody's different. What reduces their stress? I know Mary was just talking. She likes to look at the water. I agree with her. I find water like super calming. Some people, you know, exercise or taking a walk, maybe just sitting and, you know, looking around and enjoying a sunset, whatever it is for you. But you do need to purposefully build that time in. And I'm totally guilty. Like I'm a type A. I like, ch like crossing things off my list. And I could just go a thousand miles an hour and I forget to pencil this other stuff in. So I actually started doing time blocking and I found it really helpful mm -hmm. when I've actually scheduled like time off in between. And actually, I did, believe it or not. <laughs> My husband's sitting behind the camera, he's like, really, when? It's coming! Um, there are things that you can do supplementation wise. And so the reason why the rest of the list, um, <laughs> that was his thumb. It's why, like humongous. He doesn't really have a huge thumb. He's just really close to the camera. <laughs> um, the reason why there are stars next to the last bit of the list is because we don't yet know what would be the underlying cause of each of your individual issues with libido. And so when we do the nutrition response testing, which I'll introduce a little bit in a second, um, we can discover the why and what the underlying cause is and then make specific suggestions on what supplementation would be best for you. So remember, we don't treat the symptom, which in this lecture is called low libido. We treat the underlying issue, which was all the 26 things at the beginning of the lecture that we said it could be related to. So if you just went to a store, for example, and purchased one of these herbs or vitamins that's on the list, it may or may not help your situation. So it's kind of a gamble. And that's what we found is people who do supplementation programs on their own, kind of self-directed and go to the you know grocery store or the health food store and purchase some of this stuff, eventually we find they fall off of their programs. They aren't consistent. They don't really, the, their belief system isn't there because they don't see a direct improvement. And so human nature is gonna be like, I'm not gonna put my time, money, and effort into this if I don't see a direct benefit, right? So y'all got my disclaimer on that before I tell you the secret? <laughs> okay, good. Here's the secret. Adaptogenic herbs, so you could look up what that means. There's a variety of things that are called adaptogenic. So that doesn't mean it stimulates you or brings you down. It means it's balancing. So adaptogenic could go either way. If you're a little too stressed, it could lower your stress. If you're like low energy, it could actually bring you up a little bit. So a balancing act, depending on what your body needs. And the body ultimately is intelligent enough to know what to do with these things. Um, we do a 21 day purification. We just um, graduated a group that did it with us in January, but it can be done any time of the year. I specifically like the spring and the fall to do programs like that. So a little spring cleaning and then a fall detox leading into the holidays. It will kind of prevent you from overindulging in those Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, and on and on. And like there's always a reason why for the July picnics, whatever. There's always a reason. Um, but the 21 day purification works on a lot of the systems. It works specifically on the liver, and the liver is where your body does a lot of its detoxification. But the liver is also, interestingly enough, where your body manufactures hormone out of cholesterol. Mm -hmm. So do you see how this liver mm -hmm. is now so interconnected with hormones, stress levels, hormones, Toxins, anger issues. Oh, I moved the color glasses. <laughs> They're yellow on the color glasses turn. Um, there are a bunch of essential oils. I'm sure that book on the coffee table is also a good one to look at. Um, and we have a spiral bound one over here where you can look up different conditions or different uses of the essential oils. Um, but I, celery was on there again because it was on the food list. Orange is on there, and Lang Lang. And Lang Lang has been known to be an aphrodisiac. So, Langway and oysters, anybody? <laughs> B6 is a good one for hormones. Um, zinc is specifically good for male hormone production. And then tribulus is another herb that works both in men and women for increased libido, but it works a little bit differently for men than women. Women, it tends to be more of a balancer, and men, it actually can stimulate libido. So like I said, you should get tested for what your specific individual needs are. And that, I'm going to just talk a little bit about nutrition response testing so you can understand how that ties into the, what does that have to do with the pushing on the arms thing? Hey, could you grab me just one bottle off of the test kit? It doesn't matter what it is. Okay. So, on this chart, if our symptom 
is the, at the top, which tonight is called low libido. What we know is that whatever your symptom is, there's an underlying nutritional deficiency related to it. So we just named a whole list of variety of herbs, vitamins, minerals, and whatnot. And if there's nutritional deficiencies in the body, then your organs aren't happy because your organs actually need the nutrients as food to function properly. Should I move to the other side? Can you see it? Okay, I want you to be able to see too. And then you can read this anyway, right? So the worse your symptoms are, the angrier your organs are, the more nutritional needs there would be, right? And the reason we put it on a triangle is because what we know is if we change any one leg of the triangle, it's going to change all of the other ones right and so what we're trying to do in nutrition response testing is arrest any one side put a stop to this domino effect on any leg of the triangle so that the symptom will go away but the underlying cause in the organs will actually improve by feeding the body whatever nutrition it needs so can you kind of see how that's all connected okay so nutrition response testing the best way to understand it is to experience it. Have any of you realized that? Have anybody tried to leave here and go and say, hey, I met this Dr. Christy. She's all into health and wellness and nutrition. And um, she does this like push on your arm thing and then the conversation <laughs> kind of pitters out, right? Have you done that? I know. Have you even gone home and tried to push on somebody else's arm? No. Yeah. yeah. Have you done the this thing, the lock and the unlock thing? How did it go? Not well. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to maybe you need to work here. <laughs> so, Scott, will you come up so I can demonstrate the muscle testing on you? So, if you've been muscle tested, it's still kind of interesting after all this time to still hear how it works and kind of, uh, you mm -hmm. know, check in and be like, oh, yeah, now I kind of get it now that you've been doing it for a while. So, are you under any stress as you're standing here? No. Okay, so anyway, it wasn't any stress down <laughs> You wouldn't tell me anyway. So, as Scott is standing here, he can hold his arm out, no problem. And so with the muscle test, what I do is just give a little pressure. So I'm pushing down, and he's pushing up into my hand, and he's just matching my pressure. So easy enough, right? Mm -hmm. So you see how his arm stays nice and straight and solid like that? So we call that a muscle lock. And then during the test, what I do is I go around and just put light pressure over areas that represent his organs internally, right? So, for example, me pushing on his liver shouldn't cause his liver a whole lot of stress if it was healthy, right? But if it was stressed and I put pressure, his arm would give me an unlock. And that's just the way the body can communicate with me that there's some kind of imbalance there, right? Doesn't mean he has liver disease or anything that we're gonna diagnose, we're not diagnosing. The next part of the muscle test is to say, well, what does that liver need to be fed, remember on our triangle, to get the nutrients it needs to be healthy? So we have these test kits hanging all over our office and these are sample bottles of the whole food nutrition that we use to feed the body and help the body get in balance and heal itself. So the way this works is these are glass and remember I said we use whole food nutrition? So that's the difference. That's the key here is that this is real food all concentrated into capsules or tablets and so they have energy because it's living. Everything that's living and breathing we can agree has energy, right? We understand that. So the energy can come out of this bottle the same way that we can sense the energy of the sun coming through the window, right? Except the energy of the sun coming through the window is like a billion times stronger than the energy in this bottle. So it's a little easier for us to perceive, like we can see it, we can feel it and sense it on our skin. So we can't really see anything coming out of this bottle, but your body's energy is sensitive enough to know the difference and to, to know if this is something when it gets in its presence that strengthens it or weakens it or has no effect at all. Mm -hmm. So what we would do, if this was the exact nutrition that his liver needed, we would have him hold that, and then we would go back and put that light pressure and his arm would lock this time. Does that kind of make a little bit more sense how that whole thing works? When we're in the treatment rooms, we go super fast, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Have a seat. <laughs> so then, after we gather all that information through the nutrition response testing, what we do is design a clinical nutrition program that's specific to your body's needs, right? So that's what we said. Like, it's not like a one-size-fits-all, which means it fits nobody, right? <laughs> but we understand that with clothes, but the same thing with food or nutrition or diet plans or whatnot. 
So we say like this is like for a man like getting a custom suit, right? If if John and Scott got the same suit and they had their necks measurements and chest measurements and all their in in seams, I'm just saying this right, are all the are different, but then they look the same when they stand next to each other. For girls, I say the same thing. Like, has anybody been a bridesmaid? Mm -hmm. You know, those terrible dresses that they make you wear and your friend picked it out and all? I think they do that to make the bride look better and the <laughs> bridesmaids look terrible, right? <laughs> so same deal, right? If we were all in a wedding together, we'd get the same dress, but our measurements would be all different to customize to our body's needs or fittings. So that's exactly what we do with the nutrition. And then the last thing that I just like to make sure I tell everybody is that we're affecting the overall health of the body. So again, we're not just treating the symptoms, we want to get to that underlying root cause, what's, what's the overall problem, and then help that heal and monitor its progress over time. And that it's safe and natural. So you keep hearing me say food, right? Whole food nutrition. So that means that it doesn't matter if it's a, a baby, a lot of the stuff we can give to infants. We can give it to moms who are breastfeeding. We can give it to people who are on medications, um, old people, young people, you name it. And so I think that's really cool because it's safe for just about everybody. And you know, my job is to know if there's contraindications. There are specific medications and specific con conditions and specific herbs and interactions with meds. And that's my job to know that. And that's something that we look at all the time. Um, but that's... That's what we do. So that's really the end of the formal lecture. Does anybody have any specific questions? I guess we'll leave the camera on just for a second because somebody might have a question that somebody else asked. For the Facebook audience, if you do have questions, obviously we're not, I don't know how to interact with you right now, but if you leave some questions in the comment section, maybe later tonight I'll go back. I will answer anything that you place in the comment section, or if you don't want it placed publicly, we can message back and forth too, but I definitely invite you to be part of the conversation. So anything specific before we go off camera? I have one question. Yeah. Um, uh, the front page and you had your list of libido zappers and you mentioned plastic mm -hmm. so that's not you're talking about more than just plastic leaching out from something right that's the gist of it everybody's different like how much plastic exposure is necessary to cause a toxic reaction but yeah it's the water bottles the water bottles are the containers plastic baggies I think a lot of people start going and changing their containers and their water bottles, but then they're putting stuff in plastic baggies and their lunch boxes too. So you have to think about that. But yeah, it's that it leaches out into the food or the water or whatever you're using. There's a lot of shirts that are made. I'll put that out there too, something food for thought. Some of the athletic shirts are now made by recycled water bottles. And I don't know if anybody's studied what the effects are, but your body's sweating if you're exercising in them. And your pores are wide open, and then that's going to leach right into your body. So even the, the bottles that are the, it was a BPA free or stuff like that, yeah. are, those are also not good? Is that correct? To me, the jury's out. So remember, they, we used to go by the numbers, like one through five, and then mm -hmm. they had some rating, like certain ones were safe, and then they were like, oh no, just kidding, those aren't safe e either. Now you need BPA free. Mm -hmm. Well, now they've started recalling not recalling, but replacing BPA with like BPB and BPC, and people are tricked temporarily into thinking that they're safe because they have the BPA label, and they're even doing that with like children's toys, and kids are like sucking on them and drooling on them and everything like that. So, they just, again, try to replace one bad thing with maybe the next worst thing, I'm not sure. But do you see how labeling gets tricky? Mm -hmm. That's in your packets too. There's an invite to our next lecture is how to read labels. And that's when we keep on the circuit on a rotating basis because I think it's super important as you try to adopt the stuff into your lifestyle, how to be a smart consumer and not be tricked by fancy marketing mm -hmm. and label, label making. I have one other question. Sure. Oh, you said something about sunscreen. Yeah. That's kind of fair, you know, I know. that kind of stuff. So what would you do in or is there a different kind? Yeah, so again, if you go on the environmentalworkersgroup.com or on their app, you can search for sunscreens that are safer. Um, one thing, one company that I try to align with just because I know how women are, and men maybe too, but women in our beauty products, is that if I 
tell somebody that they're sensitive to the cosmetics that they're using or the lotion they're putting on their body or their sunscreen, we kind of panic. Like, we're not really willing to just not, like, go without. So, um, we do have some information on Beauty Counter, which goes by the European standards, and they have a list of 1,500 ingredients that they'll never use in their products, and they do some really outstanding testing for the safety. And they have stuff for kids and sunscreens and body products as well, as well as cosmetics. So I could get you some more information on some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But definitely, you know, start checking the Environmental Workers Group or get the barcode reader. And just start checking some of the stuff and pick the worst ones. I guess that's something I want to say, too. Does anybody feel overwhelmed that you have to go and change everything that you're doing right this minute now? And you're like, okay, what did you do? And they freak you out. <laughs> you live in a bubble. It can't be made out of plastic. <laughs> and <laughs> no, so what I say is, we give you a ton because I want to cover everything. You know, these lectures, the reason we have these lectures is I can't dive this deep into a 10 minute appointment, you know, and cover all of this stuff. So the lectures tend to be a l more intensive and cover more information and give you a lot more things like food for thought and things to think on, but you don't have to do this all at once. So look at the list, pick the two easiest, maybe the two that are the easiest. Like if it's like, oh, I have a aluminum water bottle, I'll just pull it out and stop using the plastic. Awesome. Like, you might already have some solutions in your house already, you know? Um, and then maybe pick something in there that you do the most frequently that would make the biggest, the most cumulative change in your overall health and wellness, right? And then when you've mastered those couple of things, come back and dig the list out and be like, okay, I'm ready. I'm good with those. Make those, you know, make those changes ready to take on the next thing and then maybe pick whatever the next two are. I don't suggest trying to do all of this at once and drive yourself crazy and move out of your home. <laughs> you know, it's a lot that we can do. And I think the good news about all this is that you can always do better, right? So even I, I'm not perfect, I can always do better. There's, you know, we're still always constantly making different changes with what we use. So you start with your food. I think that's a big, really good place to start, what you're eating on a daily basis, because you do that three to five to seven, however many times a day. Awesome start. Mm -hmm. Same with your water. You're putting in that in your body every day, all day long. Great. When you've mastered the food thing, maybe then move on to the self-care and beauty care products. When you've mastered that, okay, now take it bigger and maybe start to move on to the home care products, right? You don't have to do it all at one time. So thanks. That was a really good point because I stress people out during these lectures. <laughs> Thinking you've got to be perfect, right? Any other questions in house? Okay. It's a bullet stimulant. That's what you when you said caffeine. Yeah. Mm, all caffeine? <laughs> so that's a sensitive subject, and everybody's a little bit different on their willingness to let that go. So again, maybe yeah, doing cold. it gradiently. Right, but maybe doing it gradiently. Maybe doing some half-calf, half-regular, the and then starting to, yeah. So you just like the flavor of it. I, I just like the flavor of So the decaf isn't mm -hmm. stimulating you like the caffeinated stuff. Mm -hmm. right. So that's good. Yeah, I just like this coffee taste. That's okay. I was telling patients, get a coffee candle too. Like sometimes you don't need well, to no, drink I'm it. Well, you... <laughs> <laughs> so you can smell it. Like it really yeah. smells like the real thing, really? you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It smells great. Okay, so thank you for the Facebook audience for tuning in. Um, the lecture notes are always posted on our Health by Design members only page. So that's a little bit different than just the Health by Design business page. So you can find that on Health by Design FL members. And we'll upload that within the next couple of days, any of the notes from tonight.